CTV, Global Media, and other corporate news sources. And today I have two special guests. If our Jitsi channel is still up and running, uh, Adam Knudsen, are you still there? I am. And Matt Bowen, are you still there as well? I'm still here, yeah. Excellent. So both of you have been on the show before, so hopefully people will recognize you from previous episodes. But let's start with Adam. Adam, how are things going with you? Uh, things are going all right. I'm still fortunate enough to be working away, saving money, paying debt, and carrying forward as life goes forth, so not too bad for me in the world. As I mentioned in the previous video, that was your advice from the last time, that to keep your head above the water and keep working, try to make sure the money is used wisely, that sort of thing, and that is something that I've always known you to be the person to look, look to as an example on that, as far as that is concerned. But you're still working, you worked last night or something, right, where you're still kind of like up and running from wait, being awakened at early mornings and that sort of thing. Yeah, you're running the 11 p.m. to 7.20 a.m. shift here, so I'm heading into the third night at 3, so it's not too bad. Got one more to do, uh, sleeping in the daytime. It's a little bit tough, but just one more to get through, and then I'll be done. Well, I'm about a week, so it's going to be good. <laughs> Thank you for at least <laughs> being awake during this show, anyway. So, before we started the show, we were talking a little bit about the border being closed. And so, what is this, for the people that may be listening in the future, what is the current status with the Canadian border, and who can travel, and do you know any of the details of that? I know the, like, the Canadian border was closed back on March 20th of 2020 here. It was originally closed for 30 days, and then they just extended and extended and extended. We're almost at July now, and we know it's going to be closed to July 21. Uh, so the people that can travel are those that are basically semi-truckers falling in goods. I think Canada has started to allow some American family members or Canadians to come in, but they have a two-week quarantine period. You can always return to your country, but you can't get out. And then uh, the Americans have started allowing Canada to fly into Vegas, L.A., Atlanta. I think they've expanded the list of uh, airports. So is it kind of like their main hubs? Yeah, Atlanta I know is big. L.A. and Vegas is a big uh, tourist town. So I mean, you can go, you can go in via air. You can't drive down to Vegas, but you can fly to Vegas or you can fly to Atlanta, but you can't drive across. So I think there's a special exceptions if Americans are going to go drive to Alaska, we're letting those people pass through too. But it's probably down 95, 99% of its normal inner border traffic. Right. Which, I mean, if we're trying to get the R0 or the reproductive rate of the disease down, like even just getting it down to like the 98, 99% level is doing most of the heavy lifting on that side. So that part makes sense. Now, you were mentioning that you were thinking about going down to the, to Atlanta or something like that? Yeah, I bought a trailer from a manufacturer down in Georgia. I ordered it in February before any of this started. They closed the border on me in March. It got produced and out of the factory in April, and uh, I paid it in full end of April, start of May, but I haven't figured out how to go down there and bring it back yet, and I'm trying to see what I can do to concoct a plan to maybe fly to Atlanta and then borrow somebody's truck and bring it up to the Canadian border in North Dakota, Montana, but uh, that leaves the problem of acquiring a truck or buying a truck or borrowing a truck, and then when I get it back up to North Dakota, 
having whoever comes with me or whatever drive all the way back down and it is a significant distance to go yeah and, and normally would it be that because the borders closed or because of the border situation that you'd normally not have to do this stuff? Normally I would have just took a truck, drove down, hooked up, drove back. That would have been end of story. Mm -hmm. But since I can't drive across, I'm trying to figure out what else I can do. And now I at least can fly down to Atlanta, which is not overly far away from the destination. I can fly at a pretty good price, right. but I have to sort out what I can do to return it. And like I've called up Ryder and Penske. Ryder doesn't do a one-way truck rental. Penske doesn't let you tow anything but their stuff behind oh. the Penske. U-Haul's maybe a possibility, but it's all expensive. Call the hotshot service that tows stuff up, but they don't tow other people's trailers. So it's really kind of a big quagmire, and it's horribly expensive to hire these kind of things anyway, which was not the original plan. Right. So on Matt's side, now as far as Americans coming in or people traveling across the border, have you heard much on that side of things? I mean, Thunder Bay is pretty close to the border, so you'd think that something along those lines must be happening there. But have you heard anything along those lines there, Matt? I just heard the border is so closed and there's some kind of deadline for July 15th where like it's uh, they're going to open more businesses up on July 15th, but uh, I could probably see the border being closed at least July 15th. Like I seem to even have heard something along the lines of somewhere in Northern Ontario, I think Fort Francis, where people were just like crossing the river, uh, or like just not necessarily going through the, the actual border crossing, but just like going across and then not really getting, because of the borders, the guards are more focused on other things right now that people are just sort of slipping across. Have you heard anything along those lines or? No, no I haven't heard about that at all, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I think I would think most of the people slipping through would be uh, people that say that they have to go to Alaska and then they just stay in BC. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of interesting on that side. So with the border being closed in Thunder Bay, what have you noticed any impacts of that other than maybe like not as many tourists around or, or what have you kind of noticed on that side? Like it's pretty rare to see American tourists in Thunder Bay. Like, like you see people from Quebec more so like there's a lot of people here that, that you, you walk by them and they're speaking French but right. I, I rarely see Americans here. Interesting. Like I, I know uh, that they, they definitely like go hunting camping. further north but uh, and that sort of thing. But yeah. Maybe. Camping maybe, yeah. Yeah, camping too. For sure. So we were also talking a little bit uh, before the show started about the post office and how things are a little bit different there now. So from your perspective, Matt, what's different about the post office now compared to, say, a year ago or so? Okay, so like when you walk in the door at Shoppers, there's a guy there that asks you if you're going to the post office. And if you are, you have to wait in a line with like your... There's markers six feet apart, and then there's usually about five people on the line, and it might take 20 minute waiting period, and then then you can go to the post office. But and, as of and is this like 20 of, like, minutes of, like, for ago, like mailing a letter, that sort of thing? Well, yeah, like for anything, for buying stamps, sending letters, sending parcels, it's uh, there's a waiting period, but it's it's uh, back to normal for the most part now. Hmm. But you were about to say something before I interrupted, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, no, no, yeah, yeah. I was just saying that it's like they had a guy at the door and he would make you wait in a separate queue, but the person at the door hasn't been there for about two weeks and, and the queue hasn't been there for two weeks, so I guess the volume is down. Okay, so it's like getting to the point where like people have got the stamps they need. Uh, it's yeah. just, it's, there's still kind of a line there, but it's not as, not as uh, overwhelmed as it was. There's, there's yeah, or, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's not as overwhelming. Or maybe it's because we're in. I'm not sure phase one or phase two or whatever that we're in. Okay. Yeah, I think here in Saskatchewan we're on phase four of our, I think five phase plan. We're about okay. to be on phase four tomorrow. One of the two. I know our restaurants here are at something like 30 to 50 percent capacity. Bars are open and again 30 to 50 percent capacity, something along those lines. And tomorrow I think the libraries and the gyms open which is going to be a big change given they've been closed for quite a while. Yeah. And so we're opening up. Thunder Bay is still opening up. It's, a, it's not slowing down. It's opening up plan or anything like that. Yeah, all, all the patios are open. Like uh, even Boston Pizza has patios. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting on the, uh, the outside social interaction thing. One of my friends made a point that, like, there was a bunch of protests early in the COVID season where people were protesting against the isolation requirements and the lockdowns and... And I, I do seem to remember this, seeing this, especially in the States, 
where people with guns would go into their state legislatures and basically be up in arms about having to deal with this crisis. And at least from his perspective, he was noticing that the numbers didn't really spike after that. And similarly, there's a lot of news articles going around right now suggesting that the Black Lives Matter protests, despite thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe, people being out in large numbers in the streets, uh, that the spike in cases attributable to that hasn't been as high. And so it's starting to seem like that maybe it's the sunlight, maybe it's something about the circulation of air, whatever it is, it does seem to be helping with preventing the transmission of COVID. Well, Have you guys heard anything along those lines? Or I think what you're dealing with here is controlled media narratives and propaganda. Mm -hmm. Because when was the, this big bulk of Black Lives Matter protests here, it was almost probably three weeks long. And they want to say no, 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 no evidence of transmission, no evidence of transmission, no evidence of transmission. But if you turn on the TV now and you watch your big media corporations, today, yesterday, the day before, they're talking about how the spike in U.S. cases is the highest it's been throughout this entire pandemic. Right. And they somehow claim that these things are totally unrelated. And it just it's just not logical. It's not logical that you could put massive thousands and thousands of people in hundreds of different cities for extended period of times and say that there was no transmission, but two weeks after these things you still for some reason have the highest rate of transmissions in the world. you've ever had this entire pandemic you know so it, you kind of have to be willfully ignorant i think to say that they're not related at all and i, I think that is just it's politically motivated it's a politically motivated by the left to say this didn't do it and, and then politically motivated to turn around and say that it's bad and trump's doing a bad job Right. So, and I think that you're onto something on that side in terms of there is a spike, and it is two weeks later. But I think the mechanism here may be that the it may have been basically a social hop to it, where because a lot of people saw the protesters both on the right and on the left in the street getting away with not social distancing, getting away with being in close proximity with each other, a lot of people in the past couple of weeks have been thinking about their own life and going, okay, well, if they can do it, why can't I have my birthday party? Or why can't I have my, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go to the bar because obviously the large number of people out there aren't caring. Why am I shouldering this whole burden myself? And so you have like millions of people that I'm pretty sure are, are thinking along these lines, going and making those little choices in their life that are bringing them in closer contact with other people. And then two, three weeks later, now we have the big spike. I mean, that's what I think is going on. Obviously, other people can have their own narrative. And I think a lot of the protesters that you see out in the mass of things were relatively younger, healthier people yeah. that when they got it, it didn't really affect them as much, but they took it back to their parents or their older friends. And, you know, so there was a slight delay in them recognizing whether they had it or not. And, 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 the, and the, the younger people may not have even told their parents where they got it from, right? Like, if the parents ask the kid, oh, did you take part in these stupid protests? The kid probably is like, well, no, <laughs> even though they did. Jimmy right? said those. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, and this disease, you know, it doesn't really affect the younger folk nearly as much, but there is a slight potential that they would spread it to other people and then it would get going in the older population that sat out these protests and you got it there. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. But I think you are going to get to the point in time where we're going to have to recognize that this disease is probably not going away. Just like the flu is not going away. And at some point in time, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to go out and live your life or whether you're going to just stay up, hold up in your house, scared of a small disease forever. Hmm. You know, it's just going to become a fact of life. I personally think that we, it, this isn't necessary, that we can get it under control that we can, as a species, as a country, bring the numbers down. Like, Canada's numbers are actually fairly low right now. We, I think we're only at, like, 200 cases a day or something like that that we're getting, compared to especially our southern neighbors, which are totally and utterly out of control right now. We really, our numbers are not that bad. Like, it's tragic. There are people suffering, people dying, people being intubated. But compared to where we could be if it was just running wild through, say, Saskatchewan, like, Saskatchewan's doing very, very well at controlling it. And even as we open up, it seems like we're not seeing that third spike really get out of control. And so it's reasonable, I think, that we may get to the point where there's just no cases 
in Saskatchewan at least? We're at about the top of our third wave. It's just we got like 100 active cases. But the graph of active cases shows that this is very clearly about the top of a third wave. Right. But every time it goes down, it comes back from this or that or somewhere else or something happens and we get another wave through. Like we had the initial wave, which was sort of generalized around the province. We went into lockdown mode and we kind of had it almost pretty much licked. And then there was a wave in the far north where some workers came back from a Fort Mac type work camp that had it and spread it around the far north, which accounts for like over half of, about half of Saskatchewan's total case count. Hmm. And then that kind of ran through the far north for a couple of weeks and finally cleared up and dropped off. And then now it's a Hutterite community down south of Maple Creek got it and it ran through that community and they tested a bunch of people and spiked around. And then it's going to die off here. We're going to see, I think, over the next seven days, I was looking at the numbers, we got about 102 active right now and about 85 should recover in the next seven days. Hmm. So we'll be back down towards that like 20 number and then we'll see where the next round of spike comes from. So it's going to be all kinds of fun. And that's like a, one of the things going on in the world. I did want to get to one tweet that you made, Adam. So this is in reference to, I'm kind of switching topics a little bit, one Catherine McKenna. So this was back in May and I think it was, they were complaining about snow. So I'm not sure where Catherine McKenna is. It looks like Ottawa. So, because I did hear there were some places that did get some snow. Now, as far as that snow, was Thunder Bay one of the places that got, like, the really cold weather there, Matt, recently? Uh, like, just, like, recently? Yeah. No, actually, it's been pretty hot here. Okay. Yeah, I, I heard that it was cold, and then you guys had, like, a really serious storm down there. Thunder Bay, where? In Thunder Bay, didn't it? There was, like, a really serious uh, thunderstorm the past week or two? Well, then, like, May, it wasn't in, in late May. Maybe late May. Yeah, maybe May, yeah. Okay. So, in any case, so Adam's response to that was, quote, better cancel the carbon tax. So, Adam, what is your view on the carbon tax? What, is it just like a trolling cancel, or let's start with the carbon tax. Aside from the facts that would like taxation in general, the, what is the theoretical stated goal of this carbon tax? And it's got this whole backdrop of global warming, climate change, as kind of the justification for it. Hmm. And then it was a really late season winter blast. I think Edmonton got hammered, Saskatoon, and even Calgary got hammered with snow. And it was way late. You know, it's one of those things that happens, but it was way late. And it was just kind of like, all right, we got this whole lockdown going on. Gasoline consumption is down like 75 or so percent, maybe 80 or 90 percent for that span of a month or two. And suddenly we had all this cold weather move in and just slam Calgary with snow. Hmm. And it's like, what are we doing here? Have we, have we suddenly accidentally tipped the scales on the carbon emission here for the last three, four months? Because it way, way, way down from where it had been. And then you know, suddenly you got this cold weather blast. So, like, I know that there was, when I was in Thunder Bay, one of the things that Thunder Bay's city was really proud of was that it was hitting its Kyoto targets and that it was basically below the carbon emissions of where it was in like the mid 90s or so. But of course, the reason was is because industry had been basically vacated and whereas there used to be a lot more industry there basically wasn't any and like you said the whole world is in that same situation now especially in China where there used to be a lot more carbon dioxide being released now there isn't and we're now at the point where we've hit the scale we've entered a perturbation we've caused this very quick disruption so it'll be interesting to see what the effect of the, on the climate just that alone has. But as far as the total amount, like even with our removing the carbon that we're putting in, like we've added so much over the past century, right? That we still have to, going forward, deal with this problem, right? Well, I have a lot of faith in the world to heal itself. But yeah, no, the, I am very curious to see who or what is gonna try to study some of the effects of this. Like back in 9-11 when they shut down all the airlines, they had a short period of days to see what happened with the atmosphere when thousands and thousands of planes didn't take off. And we've kind of almost got the same thing now where the flights are way reduced and all the other cars are way reduced. So I don't know who's really taking a look at it, but uh, I'd be really curious to see what uh, actual numbers they can find from this uh, maps of drop that we've had this year. But yeah, you can meet your Kyoto targets easily if you just shut down all the industry and everybody can just go broke. So on your side there, Matt, what is your kind of take on the carbon tax? Well, 
the, the provincial one, didn't he get rid of it? So didn't Ford get rid of the provincial carbon tax, which, which means we pay the federal one now, right? Okay. So uh, to me, that didn't make any sense because like, you, you get rid of one, and then the money just goes to, to, to Ottawa, right? So it made more sense just to leave things how they were, but I, I personally don't see a point to the carbon tax. I think you're better off looking at the uh, like agricultural industries or, or whatever, like green energy or something, you know? Mm-hmm. And I noticed, I think it was last week's podcast with Steve, where he was talking about how here in Saskatchewan, there is credits available or the money is feeding back to agriculture, or at least some of it is starting to flow back in that direction. So that like, if you can prove that what you're doing is seeding carbon from the atmosphere back into the ground, that there is basically money attached to that. But again, I don't know if it's far enough or what the perspective is from the agriculture side, that sort of thing. Well, I know my dad is relatively frustrated with it because he's involved in farming and he kind of goes you know like well what is our alternative like our method of farming is to have these tractors drag these huge implements back and forth across the land and i mean they are rather efficient at what they're doing today but it takes a ton of gas to put a crop in a square mile it takes a ton of gas to spray it it takes a ton of gas or diesel mostly to uh, to harvest it and it takes a ton of fuel to transport it to a destination and they suck out probably way more carbon than they actually put in Hmm. but the carbon tax drives up all those costs so it's driving up all the costs of the food that people around the world eat right and uh, and i mean what are they going to do you're going to run an extension cord out to the tractor so it, it seems very poorly positioned to deal with farming in that respect. The the extension cord, it's kind of said in jest, but if SAS Power's infrastructure was a little bit more capable of putting that kind of power out there, it's not unthinkable, of course. We're just not anywhere close to that. Like, our grid is not capable of throwing that much juice at that many farmers at the same time. We're just not there yet. Well, and what would it take to run it back and forth the square mile, every square mile? of farmland in the province. How big of a cable do you need to drag behind the tractor and try not to run over it as you work the field back and forth? Or like like have like towers again, it would cost to have towers, to have something to raise it over the field so it's not dragging and that sort of thing. Towers get in the way of all the farm implements too. Exactly. So like there are technical things we could do, but each of them comes with its own problems and none of them seem obvious as the way out of this problem for farmers right now. But well, all they're getting is uh, increased cost on the diesel, increased cost on the grain drying, increased cost on the electricity. And uh, as noble and wonderful as it might be to try to sort out the problem with uh, greenhouse gas, or whatever you want to do, it's just those farmers, you know, it's not like they don't have an interest in reducing their diesel costs. I mean, they are getting into bigger machines that are more cost effective and use less diesel per square mile, but it's just sort of an unnecessary cost from farmers. Right. And it's not like they don't pull a pile of carbon out of the air anyway. When you run the tractor over the field two or three times a year, and, uh, compared to all the carbon that those fields pull out in the entire year. So. so on the other side, though, like it is, from my perspective, important to get that carbon out and to, to encourage farmers to keep doing the, the act of pulling it out of the atmosphere. But you mentioned something about the the healing itself part right? and the atmosphere kind of healing itself. Where is that coming from? Well, it's just the earth naturally cleans up all kinds of toxic materials or all kinds of things in the earth. As, as time goes on, things get broken down and sort of cleaned up and it'll find its Self back to a balance. So the earth is going to be fine in given time. Hmm. Uh, but I don't worry too much about the earth in that respect. And uh, I don't know that uh, a lot of our carbon emissions are that horrible. So they talk about parts per millions. I've heard that it's not that bad if you get out of the city, take a reading the countryside. It's not nearly as high either. Like so I, there's a little bit I know that the, the, the cities are probably a little bit different, but I like the, the one observatory that is like the standard one is like right out in the middle of nowhere by Hawaii. So that one is probably not too affected by city levels so much. Yeah, it would, it would probably be a lot less out there. But wouldn't there be the big worry, of course, that yes, the Earth will find its stasis point, that like the temperature, regardless of which way it goes, the Earth is going to be fine, the biosphere is going to be fine, it's going to just adapt. But the human species, what makes you think that we're going to be capable of making it through on that side? 
Well, I think humans, uh, humans will make it through. We're very resilient creatures. Our biggest threat is probably to ourselves from ourselves. <laughs> so, but other than that, we're humans are pretty resilient. I mean, we live in a vast difference of climates already, and, and we do quite well. A lot of the fear is that we're going to run out of food or run out of this or that, and I don't really think that a lot of those predictions are grounded in much reality. I mean, there's a lot of arable land on this planet that is not being put to use yet. And there's a lot of other areas that could be, if things do warm up, that we would actually become accessible and arable. Right. So I, I don't think it's that horrible. But as things get hotter, you know, one thing that we found out is that we get more greenery around the world. And that sucks that CO2 out of the air. Right. So it sort of finds its balance a little bit that way. Like I, my, my understanding of, on that side, though, is there is a, a limit to that, in that basically we're at or slightly past that limit, where there, especially in the grasslands, where if you increase the temperature too much too quickly, the adaption of those grasslands isn't fast enough to keep up with it. And so you see more things like grass fires, forest fires, and that the net amount is, I mean, yes, there's still some land that is gaining the ability to, to grow more grass and grow more forest etc but the net effect is negative maybe in some select areas but grasslands if they end up getting more moisture do extremely well but whether that happens or not i guess remains to be seen and that's like one of the complex parts is like what exactly is going to happen to the jet stream where is the moisture pattern is going to go that sort of thing is still is uh, clouds Clouds is a big uncertainty point, even still. Well, I don't know how uncertain it is when you got weathermodification.com out there. and You can really control, to a certain extent, uh, some of the weather nowadays. And they are doing that. Hmm. You know, they do a lot of hail suppression in Alberta or various different uh, locations have had projects to increase rain in their jurisdictions. And so it's happening, but uh, what other kind of chemicals are they introducing to the cause that is the question. So, no, we're not, I'm not too worried. Not that we shouldn't reduce it. Like, we have a natural, like, I don't think you need to force a lot of the reduction of gas use because people want to reduce their expenses already. Hmm. You know, so there's a natural inclination to reduce your expenses from gasoline consumption or diesel consumption where you can. A lot of these uh, renewable energy things, I think when they make themselves economically viable, They'll just take off like wildfire anyway. So uh, there's this certain government push to it, I think, that's unnecessary. So any comments from uh, Matt over there? You've been kind of quiet a little bit. Oh, did we lose Matt? Uh, he's on mute on his second connection. Oh, oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't really uh, know much about farming, but uh, to me, it would be, I've always wondered why people don't eat more insects. Maybe it's not like uh, socially acceptable, but it would... To me, that could be a good food source, and as far as tractors go, maybe you come up with some kind of electric tractor, like they have electric cars. That's definitely within the realm of possibility, but back on the carbon tax thing, right? Like, the way to get to both of those things happening, and even, like, as Adam, you were kind of pointing out, the way to get where people start taking the cost into account is when we add that extra whatever percent of the cost as a tax on carbon, it uses that mechanism, that, that mechanism of people making the decision of what is right in the, in the marketplace right there. Now, as far as the, it's still an extra tax, though, like you were saying before. And as long as we're, we're adding more taxes, we're still incurring this extra cost at the total level. But if, for example, we got another government in, maybe not the Trudeau government, but like, and at this point, even hard to imagine which government that would be, but one that would keep the carbon tax itself, but like reduce the tax load generally, would that make sense to keep it, but reduce the tax load generally? Or would it just being a tax on carbon, would that still be too much for you? Well, I mean, what what is our stated goal behind this carbon tax? Like I, I think the goal is a little bit lofty. And what what are they what are they trying to fund from it? Like I think it's to use the mechanism, the market, the people's willingness to see things like diesel in terms of can I reduce my costs of diesel and just have that like little bit of an extra cost to get the low carbon economy going. So you don't see that as working. I don't see it as effective. I don't see the government taxation program certainly in, in the implementation of the carbon tax as effective. Like it uh, seems really ineffective. One of the things that they do you know, is they, they're taking all this money 
and then they're sending out payments to a lot of people on their taxes mm -hmm. as just a straight money thing. Right. So it's like this. It is I definitely a wealth. Uh, taxes and they just put some gas in my truck with it. Right. And there's definitely a money is changing hands from the Canadian public, from some parts of the Canadian public to others. But the people who are paying the most are things like you mentioned, farmers, oil and gas, heavy industry, that sort of thing. Whereas the general Canadian public, who would have otherwise paid a lot more of this, is getting a little bit of a, not necessarily a cushion to land on, but at least something to keep this tax from biting as hard, right? Well, at what point in time do you get certain industries or business that just sort of make the decision to take off and go to a different jurisdiction? Right. Yeah. You know? And especially given the United States is definitely moving against action on climate change with Trump in control, that's definitely a risk. In any case, we are starting to get near the end of the show. So, Matt, is there anything you'd like to bring up or mention? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'll, pretty much all I did today was I, I bought some Cardano and then I went to the recording studio. So Cardano hasn't been mentioned on the show yet. So what exactly is Cardano? You know what, I haven't really done tons of research into Cardano, but I do know that they're going to start like a main net that allows staking, like a proof of stake where you can earn coins by holding them on their network. Mm -hmm. I did look into Cardano when it first came out, but I kind of took one look at it and saw that it was there was a lot of identity involved with it, and they were very not concerned at all about protecting people's identity when using their system. And there was something along those lines. I don't remember the exact detail, but there was, from the outset, weren't taking their responsibility of being a fungible, spendable cash system. Whatever else they were doing, that was not one of their goals or didn't seem like it. But maybe I'm kind of wrong on that side. Yeah, like it seems to be getting more popular. I need to do more research on it. I've been mostly following the, just the, the the big ones, like the XRP and the uh, Stellar and uh, you know, things like that. But I, like there aren't really that many uh, true privacy coins, except for maybe Monero and like the uh, Zcash. Except, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the, and the, the Linda coin that turned into metrics or something, like things like that. Okay. And of course, for those paying attention, both Stellar and XRP are forms of Ripple. XRP takes the name Ripple, and if you say Ripple to most people, that's probably what they're thinking of. But both of them came from the Ripple community, so that's kind of interesting that they're both still around. Now, and on your side, Adam, is there any last thing you'd like to tell the world now that you've got their attention? Keep calm and carry on. We'll get through this yet. All right. Well, and for those listening, thank you very much for listening to yet another week. And I'm going to close out with yet another song from the GNU Funk Radio. This one, again, I don't know the artist, so if anyone knows the artist, please get in touch. I'd love to know. But it is music that you can share and remix and do all that cool stuff with. Fallen Angel sounds like the name of the song. I'm not sure, but we'll find out. See you all next week. A sail set, a ship bound for crown and for country, and a dark and hole, a chain set, a man bound for blood and for power. This long journey in the name of the cross, I need to feel the earth beneath me. I wanna feel your breeze upon me. Thank you.